All right, so we're live. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I have the wonderful Robbie Thompson with us. Hi, Robbie. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that a lot of you guys probably know Robbie and what he does, but in case anyone here doesn't know, Robbie, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, talk about what you do? Uh, my name is Robbie Thompson. I'm a, a, a television writer, comic book writer, a video game writer. I don't think I've done any uh, radio dramas yet, but I'll get to it. Um, but I'm, I'm a writer uh, and uh, internet troll, I guess, from time to time on Twitter. Um, that's me. There you go. So Robbie is actually one of my favorite supernatural writers what? ever. Yes. It's very nice of you to say. So I'm very glad that you're here today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, we, we met at C2E2, uh, where I got to uh, meet both you and your awesome dad. And um, when I got home from the show, I was just talking about it with my wife, about like you know different people I met. And then we actually went on your YouTube channel. And because my, my wife is actually like a cool person, uh, and like is 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 one of one of the youth. Like she was like we were watching your videos, and she watches a lot of YouTubers, and she actually you know knows what like is good and what's not. She's like, oh, she's really good. You got to go on her show. So, once again, uh, all good things in my life uh, come from uh, come from my wife. So uh, thank you to my wife, but also thank you for having me. It was really great meeting you guys in Chicago. That was a fun show. Oh, awesome! I didn't even know that. So thank you to your wife, and <laughs> it was great to meet you too. Yeah, that's awesome because I'm a fan of her work as well. She's the best. She's the best. Yeah. All right. So we are, we have comments coming in the chat, but we took comments from Twitter that I wrote down as well. So I wrote them down too. Yeah. I'm trying to multi screen, as you kids say. This is very complicated. I'm totally going to screw this up, but let's do it. All right. Well, we'll go with a simple question first. So, how did you start writing for Supernatural? I started writing for Supernatural um, in season seven. Um, I uh, I was unemployed and looking for a job, and my agent at the time called me up and said, uh, "What are your thoughts on Supernatural? Uh, they have a possible position at someone at your level." Uh, I think at the time I was what's called an executive story editor, which is a total bullshit title. I was just a, I was, I was a staff writer. They're all bullshit titles. Um, that's my favorite dumb one though, because you're not an executive or an editor. You kind of handle story, but not really. Um, and um, I had only seen episodes uh, featuring Richard Spate because he's an old friend of mine. We've known each other for 20 plus years uh, out here in Los Angeles. We both went to USC. And uh, so I was like, I, I love the show, but I've only seen Richard's episode. And like, if you haven't watched the show and you've only seen his episodes out of context, the show seems kind of insane. Um, you know, like when you're watching, you know, something like, you know, uh, like changing channels, you're like, w w I think this is awesome, but it plays much better in context. Um, so um, I, uh, I, I, uh, I agreed to take the meeting and I decided, you know, because I, I take uh, the, uh, my work very seriously, I was like, I'm going to do homework, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my research. And so I went to the library and I checked out um, uh, seasons one through, I think three, no, seasons one through four. And my plan was to just like watch the pilot and like a couple like greatest hits and I would go on online and I went online and tried to find like the best of list. And like I had never, that was my first interaction with searching Supernatural online. <laughs> which you got to make sure, number one, your image safe search is on uh, if, you're, if you're using Google. Um, but also, uh, it was very, very clear that this was a very, very passionate fan base. Um, so I, I, I found a couple lists, and I started writing down titles. But then I put in the first disc, uh, and I watched the pilot. And then like the sun rose and the sun set. And like, you know, uh, basically 12 days later, I had watched about, I think, three seasons. Um, so I went, and I met with Sarah. And by that point, I was nervous because I really liked the show, and I really wanted the job. Uh, fortunately, Sarah was awesome. She's a fantastic human being. And um, I met with her, and then I left that meeting thinking, like, well, shit, now I really want this job. Like, what do, what do I, what do I got to do? Um, and I knew that I had to have a second interview with, with her and with Bob Singer. And so I, I kind of waited another week, and I thought, well, you know, I blew the meeting. I screwed it up. I didn't get it. But I went back, and I got, I think it was, like, season four and five, and I, I just kept watching. Because at this point, I was, fan, I was a fan. I was hooked. Uh, fortunately, though, I got a call uh, from my agent, and uh, I sat down with Sarah and Bob, and um, and the rest is history. They 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 took uh, great pity on me and uh, and hired me. Uh, they took a huge chance on me. Um, at the time, you know, I didn't have a ton of experience, particularly with writing uh, individual drafts. I think I'd only written one solo script at that point, point. and like I said, I was only an ESC, which is like a you know second third year writer, depending on how how you've how your career has gone. So they took a huge chance on me, and I'm I'm forever in their debt. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of 
my short story uh, getting to that show, I'd been on a couple shows beforehand, all of which had gotten canceled. And I was I was terrified I was going to be the, the person that would cancel Supernatural um, or get it canceled rather. But the show's unkillable. So fortunately for me, I, I got to be there for five years, which was which was awesome. That is so cool. That's great that you got the opportunity to do that, right? Like almost right off the bat, too. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I got really lucky. I, I, I'm fairly certain, and if they're watching, they would know uh, I was their second or third choice. So uh, whoever uh, didn't take the job or couldn't do it for other timing reasons, I'm also in their debt. Uh, it's, it's always, it's not bad to be number three sometimes. Well, I think the fandom's very grateful that you got in there too, because a lot of people love your episodes. So. Well, I'm grateful. I, it, it, the, the five years I got to spend on the show was, was uh, beyond uh, fun, and, and it was incredibly educational for me as well, uh, and really helped me grow as a writer. Definitely. So moving into kind of like more specific questions about writing for Supernatural. Yeah. Um, Terry wanted to know, when you're writing dialogue for the show, do you have to get inside Jared and Jensen's head as well as Sam and Dean's, or do you just kind of write... Um, knowing that Jared and Jensen are going to infer things. I spend most of my time, even now, trying to get inside Jared and Jensen's head and just wondering what they're thinking, <laughs> uh, <laughs> how their days are going. Um, you know, typically for me, um, you know, I, I looked back at, at episodes. I would oftentimes, when I was writing, I would, I would put an episode on in the background or if I was going for a walk, especially once it got on Netflix, I would just kind of like let it play on my phone while I was out for a walk or whatever. Um, I like to listen to the show. The show is the voice of the show. Um, I guess an, a way of answering that question, though, is that I, in some ways I'm, I'm listening to Jared and Jensen like they have created those characters over the course of whatever it is now, 700 years, um, and they've really built them performance-wise, you know, from season one through through season uh, uh, infinity. So I, I think it's a combination. You're, you're ultimately trying to get into each scene, like trying to figure out who is the focus of that scene and who has uh, the most you know, stakes in that scene. But then, you know, from scene to scene, you're kind of switching. Like, you know, people ask, like, do you, you put yourself into your scripts? And the answer is yes. Every single character that I'm writing, I have to put myself into that person's point of view. So it was it was really fun to be like, you know, Sam for a day or like Dean for a day, uh, Crowley for a day, uh, you know, Castiel for a day. Like, it was a blast um, to get into that. But it's kind of a dance because, you know, you're you're seeing their performance and you're reacting to it. So, you know, we're kind of like co-authors in that way. Um, I, I can't say I've ever successfully gotten in, in their heads at all, um, but I, I was really listening to what they were doing performance-wise and, and trying to, to modulate and make sure that I was, I was respecting the voice of the show. Yeah. I mean, was it also weird, too, like, because you, you're writing the script and then you see it, I guess, reflected on the screen because yeah. it's, it's so interesting to me how that happens because... I was lucky enough, Nicole Snyder sent me a copy of the script that she wrote, yeah. and yeah. I, I went through, and I read the script, and then I watched the episode, and it was so cool to see the little changes and the yeah. way that they yeah. portrayed the script, so is that, is that interesting to you, how your writing it's translates? It's my favorite part, you know. Um, uh, there are little moments when I watch the episodes uh, that I was lucky enough to write. There, are m nine times out of ten, my favorite moments are moments that, uh, you know, the boys added on the day, or you know, the director, you know, cut a line or or suggested a moment, and and the actors just kind of found it on the day. There's also the fact that you know we also have uh, incredibly talented um, uh, editors who will make certain choices and. It may have been a look that was going off camera at one point, but you know they took that moment and assembled it over here, and suddenly that look has more meaning than than was was maybe in the script. So it, it's a great collaboration. Uh, you know, I would sit uh, when the episode aired. Um, once I had like what we call like you know like the network copy, like when it's when it's all done, I would watch that copy with my script the same way, and I would I would try to like write down like what did I get right, what did I get wrong, what was I overwriting? You know, uh, you know most of the time. It's dropping lines, you know, when you, especially when you have two actors like the, like, like the guys that have been playing these parts for so long, you know, they have this ability to have this shorthand that you just don't need the dialogue, you know. Um, again, like I, if I look through and like if you did like uh, whatever it's like, you know, document changes like on Microsoft Word, like, it, like I would say the majority of the time it's dropping the line, you know, playing it off a look, um, playing it and just making it a moment that's nonverbal. Um, um, again, it, it, it's, a, it's a huge luxury to work on a show like that where you have uh, a cast that's so committed and can give you those moments. You know, um, Whenever we would have new directors come in, 
that was often the advice was like, let it roll for a little bit. Let the boys give you a little bit of a button. They'll give you a moment or a look, you know, and, and you never know what it's going to be. Like, uh, you know, there was an episode where uh, all I wrote was, uh, you know, that they were ironing clothes, but they added a whole bit with, you know, ironing it with beer, which was not scripted at all. And, you know, it's kind of this great surprise when you're watching the dailies and you start laughing and it makes the scene come alive again in a way. Cause you know, by that point as a writer, you've seen that scene 50 times in your head. So to see it, you know, brought to life in that way was, was always a blast, but it, it, it was all throughout the process through, you know, through the actors, through the directors, and, and then the editors as well. They all contributed uh, and, and made the show, uh, each episode, really special. But those are always my favorite moments, you know. Yeah, the non-scripted stuff is really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as a writer, what kind of, I mean, how often were you involved in both the editing process and the actual, like, on-set process? Did you go visit the set frequently? Like, what did you do there? So typically, uh, a TV writer, um, you're a, what's called a writer producer, um, and you're involved in every facet of the production. Um, Supernatural, I always used to joke, was kind of like um, it was kind of like what it was probably like to work, uh, like you know, like on Miami Vice or Moonlighting in the '80s, like where you're kind of a freelancer. Even though I was on staff, um, the way that the way that the show is run, and the way it's it's always been run since season one, was you ship your uh, scripts up to Canada, and we do all of our prep, you know, sort of over the phone or or whichever. And then everything kind of comes back to you. Um, and because it's such a phenomenal crew and, and because the show is so well run, um, you know, we were typically, you know, prepping a script, you know, you know, two to three weeks in advance of even the prep prepping of the episode, which when I tell my other writer friends that they just start to cry because, you know, usually they were given like two days to write an entire episode where I usually got, you know, anywhere. I think the shortest was four days to two weeks. So we were never really um, much involved, um, you know, in terms of going up to set. I, I'm a set rat, though. I love being up there and I love seeing it. So I, I, uh, I sort of forced my way up there. Uh, but it ended up being an awesome experience. I got to shadow um, uh, Bob Singer a couple times on um, uh, an episode called Pac-Man Fever and then another episode called uh, uh, Slumber Party. And it was awesome, particularly the second visit, because that one I, I, I got to watch uh, him work through prep. So prep is like the two week time when, when the, the, the incoming director is sort of preparing, um, you know, looking at locations, looking at set builds, working with, you know, really talented artists like, you know, Jerry and, and Serge and, and all these wonderful people and kind of building the mechanics of how they're going to spend the eight days shooting. And I learned just, just a ton from watching how Bob worked in that because 90% of his decisions uh, for directing on the day were being made during that time. So it was incredibly educational for me to like be up there and say like, well, this is why we need to use this like this location for five pages because they got to build it. <laughs> so I have to justify the cost for that. Um, or you know, you you set up something that you're like, oh, it takes place at this gas station, but then you actually physically go to the gas station. And you realize, oh, it's an automated gas uh, station, so I don't need the gas attendant to be there. I need to figure out a way to get that that exposition or or in a different way. So it was, it's little things like that that you really, really learn. Um, I, I love being on set, and, and the, the times that I was up there was, was really, it, it, was, it was really special because it's a really phenomenal crew. Um, most of them have been on, on the crew uh, since, you know, season one, which is, it's, it's insane. You know, like, people have grown up. They've had kids, you know, like, their kids are, like, in junior high now. It's, it's nuts. Um, so it's a really tight group, and it's really, it's a special place to be. I, I always tell fans that when I meet them, uh, you know, comic shows and stuff like that when they're considering going to a convention, a uh, supernatural convention. I'm like, if you get a chance, just once go up to, to the Vancouver convention because a lot of times they, they because uh, I was up there uh, when there was one of the conventions and they everyone from the convention kind of found us and it was great because we all got to hang out. They got to see the shooting of the of the show and it was really, it was really, really a good time. So, and as far as editorial, like it was kind of, you know, up to up to the individual and also up to the editor, you know, we also, uh, at a certain point, you get what's called an uh, or a producer's cut or editor's cut, whichever, and then you kind of give notes on that as well. And 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 typically, what you're looking at in that situation is uh, like things to cut. Uh, most of the episodes would come in a little bit long, uh, especially the episodes I wrote. Um, they would end up being really really long, uh, which is embarrassing, uh, uh, and uh, means I didn't do a very good uh, good job assembling the script. Um, but you know, it, it was actually a great, um, uh, a great crew of, of editors as well. They're, they're very, very talented folks. And I started in post-production. So, you know, I really look at what they're doing as like the last draft of the script. And so it's, it's, um, 
it wasn't something that, you know, that we were typically asked to do on Supernatural, but I sort of elbowed my way in there uh, sort of clumsily, uh, mostly because I really wanted to learn. And I'm really grateful to particularly Bob uh, for, for being really patient and, and listening to my uh, endless questions, uh, some of which were probably pretty stupid. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was, it was great th to be able to see the process, you know, from, you know, you know, putting it up on my dry erase board in my office to you know, sitting in like you know, uh, you know Don's editorial suite and watching like the final you know, you know playback of it. It's just it's it's a it's a cool experience. Yeah, the process is just so amazing. I I mean, it's just such a collaborative thing, and you realize so many people work on it, and so many parts have to come together to make it. It's just so cool. I'm just actually looking over now at the different questions. Oh my gosh, I can't I can't keep up. <laughs> Hello, everyone in the chat. Um, I love you all. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. There's so many comments. <laughs> I'll I'll go online afterwards and try to answer some of them if if we don't get to them. Um, but yeah, that was the answer. My very long-winded uh, answer to your question. Okay. Well, it was a good answer. So thank you. All right. So a couple questions here. A lot of them about female characters because uh, mm -hmm. you're very well known for penning some really great female characters. So. How do you feel about having done that? Both, I mean, with Supernatural, and then you've also got the Silk comics that you've mm -hmm. written as well. A lot of people really look up to the female characters that you've created. Like, how does that make you feel? I, I think it's awesome. Uh, I, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, I think I've always been drawn to uh, female characters, um, uh, largely because of my mom. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of the expression "strong female character" because. You never hear strong male character. Like no one's ever like, oh, Indiana Jones, what a strong male character. It's, it feels very kind of bullshitty to me. But but to use the the expression, um, you know, I was raised by a strong female character, and um, you know, growing up, I didn't often get to see her, uh, you know, on TV uh, uh, or in movies very much. Uh, in particular, because uh, she's a nurse, and so we would watch a lot of hospital shows. So I knew the hospital drama from reality, and then I would watch it, and it was like all these like you know like like male, you know, like white doctor dudes. Um, and so, so some of it, I think, you know, just comes from that. It's just sort of a preference. But, you know, the, the stuff that I grew up loving, you know, like, you know, Ripley in the second Alien movie or, you know, Princess Leia uh, later on, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, you know, like these are characters that I really just, you know, were drawn to and, um, and I really enjoy writing. Um, you know, on a show like Supernatural, it's a, it's a, it's a very male heavy show. Uh, it's very boy, uh, boy driven and, and that's all, that's all good. Um, but there's been a lot of really great uh, female characters throughout the history of the show. Um, and um, I was always drawn to those characters and, and some of them I wanted to bring back, some of them I never got to bring back. Um, but the opportunity came along to create a couple um, and it was, it was really, really great. It was, a, it was a great experience. And I had great collaborators throughout this process, uh, or that, that process, you know, whether it was you know, Sarah Gamble or Bob Singer uh, or Felicia Day um, or Shoshana, like, you know, to, to have a great partner for that dance was 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 a ton of fun. Um, but no, I, I I love it. It's it's great. I would I hope to do more. Oh yeah, we'd love to see more. <laughs> so, okay, Lynn wants to know, and this, uh -oh. this yeah, is this Lynn? Is this my is this my Lynn? Lynn, yes. how are you? Are you watching? I'm looking at Twitter now to see if she's. Uh, all right, my Twitter's a is a is a mess. Um, hi, Lynn. I, Lynn, uh, in, like I want to, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, so uh, we talked beforehand, you and I, and you sent me a list of questions, and I, I think Lynn sent me a what I felt was a softball, and so I, I threw it back to her, and, and and she sent us, I think, what was it, like two or three, like yeah. very, very delightful questions. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm ready to be hit with them. Yes, I guess she was like challenge accepted because she came back with three more. <laughs> so the first one pertains to. Um, you know, female character, yeah. and so she's asking, you know, the character of Eileen mm -hmm. at her demise this season, so even though you're not writing for the show anymore, was that painful? Because she said it was very painful for her. Well, I mean, look, anytime, if you love a character, yeah, it, it's always a bummer, you know, like, uh, a spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the latest, well, I won't say it, but if you haven't seen the latest, uh, or the last Star Wars movie, there was a character that me uh, meets his end, uh, and I was, you know, I, you know, I, I had, you know, uh, uh, I had a very wet face uh, after after that. Um, so it's always it's always a bummer. Um, but you know, uh, you know, I, I wasn't there, you know, for for that decision, and you know, I don't know the context of, you know, where those stories are going. So you know, 
uh, you know, I think for me as a fan, you know, it's always, if you're not feeling the death of a character, that to me is when I'm concerned, you know, like if someone dies, like I haven't, uh, I'm not caught up on, on walking, on walking dead. I think I've only watched like the first handful of the first season, but like, you know, I, I see enough online about like, Oh God, so-and-so died. Like after a certain point, like there must feel like, you know, like a war of attrition. Um, but you know, if, if people aren't reacting in, in some way, you know, like that's where for me as a writer, I would be concerned. Um, but, um, but no, it's a bummer when any character gets killed. I, I say this though, as a, as someone who, who killed off some characters on Supernatural and also pitched a ton of uh, killing a ton more characters that I never successfully got to kill off. Um, uh, uh, so, um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, what can you do? Well, I mean, I was curious about the fact that, you know, since you created Eileen, even yeah. though you're not working on the show anymore, yeah. do they, do the writers who are currently working on the show, do they ever talk to you about her character or? Oh, n no. And, and, and to be honest, they shouldn't, you know, um, you know, it, it I think a couple times I reached out to Kripke um, for very specific things. I think one time in the 200th episode, and then very specifically, I, I reached out to him for uh, for the last episode I wrote, Don't Call Me Shirley, because um, there was a moment where I pitched in the room making fun of Revolution, and, and it, it felt funny at the time. And then when I was typing it, I was like, oh, God, this feels really, you know, potentially uh, it could be go pretty sideways. And so I just reached out to him. I sent him an email, and, and you know he's a very busy guy. And and he was he was he very graciously wrote me back, and actually pitched a, a line that was funnier. Um, um, but no, like there's no reason. Like I, I don't work on the show, and and you know it's it's a tricky thing. You know it, when you create a character for a show, ultimately that show belongs to the show and to the audience. And so I, I don't I, I don't have any sole authorship over those characters. If I had you know any regret about you know, uh, you know, my time certainly writing like, you know, Charlie Bradbury, uh, I wish more writers had had a chance to to write that character. And I hope, you know, because it's supernatural, you never know if characters can come back. Um, I hope that that um, that other writers have a chance to to write the, uh, that character because it gives the character a chance uh, to grow more, you know, so. So no, uh, they, they never reached out to me, um, but but there was no reason to. It, that would be, it would actually be kind of weird. And also, I don't know if I could legally even like, you know, like say like, you know, like, you know, uh, don't do it or whatever. I mean, like I, I think I would feel a little bit weird. Um, but uh, but you know, they 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 they're entrenched in a way that for me now watching you know the show as a fan that I'm not, and so they're also making a lot of decisions you know um, behind the scenes that that I have no privy to outside of my own like emotional reaction. So uh, no, they never reached out to me. But but there was there's really no reason for them to. Okay. Yeah, I was curious about that because I didn't really know how that whole process worked since I'm yeah. more focused on editing. I don't know how the whole collaboration between writers works. So that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know well, that. Once you, once you leave the show, so I left after, I had two deals on the show. I had a three-year deal and then a two-year deal. And then um, they very kindly asked me back, but I, I wanted to explore some of my own stuff. And um, after that, like, I'm no longer an employee of the show. I'm still bound by, like, you know, I don't own the scripts, for example, that I wrote. Like, they own them. Um, so like anytime I've contributed to like a, like a charity or something like that, I always try to get permission first to make sure that I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm being cool. Um, but, um, but no, once, once you leave, you're, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of out the door and, you know, it, it, rightfully so, like they, they need to make a, you know, a ton of decisions, um, you know, on, on their own. And, and when you're, when you're watching an episode, the decision to make whatever has happened in that episode was made six, eight, sometimes, you know, 10 months ago, depending on the air, the airing uh, of, of a show. So it's very hard to react, like we like, will react, like, you know, as an audience member, but like, that's a decision that's already been made and consequences of that decision, uh, story-wise have already been kind of weighed and, and, and kind of figured out by that point, so. Okay, cool, that's interesting, I did not know that. Oh, wait, someone's asking me about pineapple pizza. I wanna be very clear, uh, I love pineapple, but it does not belong on pizza. Uh, so whoever asked that question, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a quality question. I've seen so many people asking you that on Twitter. I, I, I've been trolling, uh, that for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm a troll. I'm, 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 I'm a jerk store. So uh, that was, it was, that was one of Lynn's questions. Did she have some more? She did. Um, okay, bring it on. I'll go back to hers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you had the choice, well, you made the choice to include in the 200th episode, some controversial content, well, controversial to anyone like outside the fandom, I guess. 
And she said that she liked the explicit explicit mentions of, you know, Destiel and Wincest and all the shipping that you put in there. Yeah. Um, oh, for, for, two, for the 200th episode. Yes. Yeah, okay. And she said it seemed like a very Kirky-esque thing to do. So what was your <laughs> thought Kirky-esque process? word? <laughs> I guess. We'll put it in the dictionary. Um, uh, what was my thought process on that? Um, this is my uh, this is my Verners, by the way. If we have any uh, watchers in uh, in Michigan, this is this is Michigan pop. So this one's for you guys. Oh my gosh! Um, so my, your question was about uh, putting Destiel and Wincest and stuff like that. You know, there was no way to do that episode without um, addressing um, um, fandom. Like it was called fan fiction. Um, it was terrifying to do that. Um, and I don't know if I was successful in it at all. Um, you know, when they mentioned um, wanting to do a musical episode, I was marginally, you know, uh, again, terrified. I did not know I was going to write it. Um, all I knew was the first three episodes were going to deal with, you know, uh, you know, Demon Dean. And then we were going to have like a pause. And then the, the fifth episode, I think it was the fifth episode. I can't remember. They all blend. Um, was going to be this 200th episode. And so I knew it, it had the potential to be sort of like, you know, uh, like standalone-y uh, in, in its own way. Um, um, and um, I just thought like doing a musical, like my first reaction, because uh, Bob and Jeremy came in in the room and they're like, we're doing a musical. And I was like, that's terrible. Can I write it? Because uh, it just seemed like an idea where like you could either succeed or fail. And um, I am really drawn to those ideas if I'm not scared. Uh, while writing, particularly like a show like Supernatural that has always pushed itself and always trying to be kind of meta and different and weird. Um, like I want to make sure that like once a season I was in a position where I was like, oh God, am I going to fail? And so early on in that process, I was like, well, you know, they've, they've, they've mentioned, you know, um, uh, you know, through the, through the Supernatural books and then like uh, the Supernatural conventions, a lot of this stuff before, but I, I really wanted to, you know, just address it sort of head on. Uh, and it actually ended up being a lot of fun. Um, you know, um, it, the whole process of it ended up being a ton of fun. Was it scary? Yeah, like, you know, I, I try to, like, view things as both a writer and as a fan. And, you know, when shows kind of push boundaries like that, it's, it's a dangerous thing. You know, it's a, it's a slippery slope, you know, because you're, you're pushing up against some very clear boundaries that some people do not want to have pushed. My feeling was, uh, and that's why if it's Kripke-esque, I'll take it as a compliment, was you know the show had a very established track record of of pushing those boundaries, of of pushing up against it and maybe pushing too far or maybe not pushing you know far enough. But you know, after a French mistake, I think the gloves were sort of off a little bit. And you know, for me, it felt like if if we were going to do an episode like this that was this absurd, you know, that was this crazy, um, we had to push it as far as we could go. And you know, much to their credit. Um, you know, Jeremy and Bob uh, were, were all aboard and that's, you know, what they wanted to do. They wanted to, to, to have it be a, a, as much as we could a celebration of the show and very specifically of, you know, for my money, you know, the best fans in the world. And so we, we meant it with affection and we meant it with love. And, um, I, you know, my hope was that if we came at it from a, from a pure place um, that, um, that everybody would, would, would embrace it. Um, and, you know, uh, we also had great partners in Jared and Jensen. They really embraced it as well um, and, and, and even pushed it even further. Like, you know, Jensen has that great moment where he, uh, where he sort of looks to camera, um, which was not scripted. That's just, that's just Jensen being awesome. And it's a great, it was, it was it, again, it, like we were saying before, like that's one of those moments where I was like, oh, that's, that's even better than I could have scripted. Um, so yeah, like, you know, I, it was definitely scary, uh, and, and it was definitely like, oh shit, are we gonna, are we gonna push too far here? You know, every time you do an episode like that, you're, you're definitely pushing a boundary, um, between the audience and the author. Um, but it felt like we had, um, a, a pretty, um, uh, you know, a pretty clear track record of doing that as a show. Uh, again, where, whether or not you're looking at something like changing channels or even, you know, um, I'm trying to think of, you know, other crazy, like, even like mystery spot, you know, like, like episodes that are, that are, are, are trying to, you know, kind of push things a little bit. Um, so it, it felt like we had kind of had to, um, and then, um, uh, uh, it, it ended up, it ended up hopefully uh, working out. Uh, I, I do hope people like the episode. 
Oh, definitely. That's one of my favorite episodes, at least. I, uh, it's funny, before I even started watching Supernatural, because I started watching right after season 10 had finished, so I, that was one of the first things I saw of Supernatural was a clip of them singing from that oh, episode right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, on YouTube right after my cousins told me about the show and I looked it up and that's one of the first things I saw and I watched it and I was like, this looks interesting. Let's watch the show. So that's really cool. That's really cool. Uh, you know, it's funny with the singing, you know, we talked, you know, very specifically, you know, at the beginning, um, for some reason, like, like when they, cause they, they came in uh, like, and they're like, Oh, they go to a, a high school where there's a musical version of supernatural a la, you know, the Chuck Shirley books or inspired by, and, uh, you know, for some reason early on, I was like, I don't know if I want to see our cast sing, um, just because they can, you know, like they can actually sing, but I don't know if their characters could. And, you know, and I'd also felt like, you know, we had kind of seen that version of it before. And it felt like, you know, again, the, the, the more we could, you know, make the audience part of the show, uh, the, the better off we could be. I think we talked at one point because it was being shot during Vancouver's convention. Um, we talked about filling the audience with actual people from the convention. But then we were worried that we'd never get a take, you know, because people would be like, you know, the boys would come out and, and, uh, and we've all seen how audiences uh, rightfully react to those uh, very handsome gentlemen. So uh, it ended up not happening. Oh, well, that would have been really cool, though. I've always wondered, you know, how they, if they pick fans to put in the background or something like that. Yeah, I don't know if they ever have. I mean, I know it's it's always fun during VanCon when you see people posting pictures, you know, uh, and it's like there's that, and there's like you know, fifty to hundred, you know, incredibly respectful, uh, you know, fans, uh, you know, watching, you know, watching them make the show. It's really cool. Definitely. All right, so I'm, try, I'm trying to scroll. Like while you ask, I'm gonna scroll through. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Literally. So many. All right. Uh, another question. I'm being called a pineapple troll. That's that's accurate. Maybe you should change your Twitter username to pineapple troll. Probably. You're probably right. Mm -hmm. Is there? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. There's too many. I'll I'll try. I'll, we'll we'll keep going. Okay. okay. Yeah. There's just so many people want to ask you things. You're very popular. <laughs> All right, so I have a question. Yes. And I mean, there's been a lot of talk about a spinoff of Supernatural called Blue yeah. or Daughters, which mm -hmm. would focus on, you know, mainly female characters. Yeah. And a lot of people have expressed interest in you possibly writing for that. Is that something that you would be interested in if it was ever to become a thing? Well, I mean, I, first of all, I hope they do make it. Um, you know, I think um, there's so many. Uh, rich stories to be had with those characters, whether it's on the, on the mothership show, so to speak, or, or a spinoff. Um, so I, number one, I hope they make it. Uh, number two, I, I don't, I, right now I'm kind of trying to focus on doing my own stuff. Um, I, I'll never say no. Um, I know one of the questions was, would I ever come back to Supernatural? I think I joked with the guys that I would, I'd be back for season 20. Um, so, you know, seven more years and uh, I'll come back, you know. Um, I never, you know, it was really great, you know, when, when I, when I, when I left, it was a very, 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 very difficult decision. And again, I'm really grateful to, to Bob Singer and to Jeremy Carver. Um, you know, last year we, uh, we got a really early pickup, which was very unusual. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the CW and Warners has always been very, very supportive of the show, but that kind of went above and beyond. And it really helped showrunners make a lot of very difficult decisions quickly. Um, and I was actually out of town by that point and I had already written, uh, don't call me Shirley. And it was, I think prepping at that time. And Jeremy called me up and, and cause Bob was up prepping cause he was directing that episode and they, they mentioned, you know, uh, would, you know, we got picked up and we'd like to have you back. And, you know, how do you feel about that? And, and, uh, I was like, can I, can I think about it? Cause I really want to make sure I'm making the right decision. And, you know, I, he, and Jeremy was great, you know. Again, these are these are decisions that they need to make quickly to order to move quickly, and and he couldn't have been more more kind and gracious. And I and I took like a week to really think about it and talk to my wife and I talked to my crack team of entertainment professionals and and my friends. And it just felt like it was a good opportunity to to really kind of pursue some of the stuff that I've I've been pursuing, you know, while working on supernatural comic books, my own pilots, uh, movies, and stuff like that. And um, it was it was reaching a point where I, I didn't think I could do all of the above, and so I, I kind of selfishly you know chose to to pursue my own stuff. But they the, you know when I called both Jeremy and then I, I called Bob up in Vancouver, they they couldn't have been greater about it, you know. And and you know they were like you know the doors the doors always open and 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 
uh, again, like that, that kind of stuff doesn't normally happen. Usually like, you know, you leave a job, there's a little bit of awkwardness or bad blood, but you know, they, they couldn't have been nicer to me. And, and again, I'm, I'm very grateful for it, but I, I don't have any plans to, to work on it, but I, I, I'm, I'm desperate to see that show. I, I really hope it happens. And uh, I think it's pretty special um, that it's something that, you know, uh, I used to work on a show called Jericho, which was canceled and then brought back because fans demanded it come back. And that was a really special experience. So to see people react to characters that they really like and want to see more stories from them, uh, particularly those actors and those characters, it's just, I think it's a really unique uh, thing. And it's, it speaks volumes of, of this, of this fandom. Yeah. I mean, there's so much, so much push for that show and I would love to see it happen. I think it would be great. I, I, I would too. Definitely. Okay, I'm, I'm scrolling through. Uh, I worked on Jericho. That's true. Uh, I would write a video game. I have written video games. I'm sorry. I'm just scrolling through. Go ahead. <laughs> There's too many. <laughs> I know. Heat of the moment. Yes. Yes. Quality song. Quality song. Um, all right. Sorry. Go on. It's too hard to read and, and, and think at the same time. Honestly. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so. All right. I work in um, comics and I, I always hear my artist friends say like, oh yeah, I was watching this thing while I was working, you know, cause they're drawing while they're, you know, watching like, you know, Star Trek, the next generation or whatever. And I'm so, so jealous, you know, uh, cause I'm like, I can't, I listen to the same ambient song on repeat for like 12 hours, uh, like a, like a lunatic, or I'll listen to whatever, like when I worked on supernatural, whatever song I was featuring in that episode, like my play count for, uh, for night moves is probably like in the thousands. So yeah, good times. Tough if you're my wife, but good times for, for me. Yeah. Well, I feel like when you're writing, it's a little bit harder to pay attention to things that involve talking and, you know, actual, yeah. like, following up plot. But, you know, when you're drawing or something like that, it's a little bit easier to focus on both. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, 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 I can do it if it's a song that I'm really into. Um, like, there was an episode I wrote, uh, uh, I don't remember which season. Uh, that's terrible. I'm getting old. Uh, Goodbye, stranger. And I must have listened to that song like a million times. Um, you know. Uh, and then there were songs that I thought were going to be in the episode and ended up not being in the episode. And so now when I hear them, it's heartbreaking. You know. Uh, oh, no. um, or there's songs that I didn't know were going to be in the episode and now I love. So, um, but yeah, I, I I tend to listen to ambient music or or a lot of soundtracks. A lot of soundtracks. Definitely. All right. So, if you we're going to return to Supernatural, just even if it was just for like a one-off script. What in the year twenty twenty-five? Go on. Yes, and they it could happen. It Let's could happen. be honest it could here. Happen. I'm not saying no. <laughs> so I'd be crazy to. Well, if you ever were to come back, yes. What story besides space <laughs> did you not get to write? What would like to? I you know here hold on let me see if I can reach it. I have. So I, I like to write uh, uh, longhand first, and I have like uh, like a metric ton of these notebooks that are filled with with uh, with uh, movie ideas and, and TV show ideas, but also like and I'm staring at them right now. They're 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 on the other side of the room, but I, I have a, a bunch of these that are filled with uh, either failed supernatural pitches or or you know episode ideas or sometimes just titles, you know, or a song. Um, I, I still will sometimes I'll hear a song and I'm like shit, how did I never use that song or like, you know, or it's a newer song, um, you know, I'm like, oh God, that would be a great song for the last five minutes of an episode of Supernatural. Um, I don't know if I could narrow it down. Um, you know, I will say that when, 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 I, uh, when I left, I knew at that point, because it was already written, um, that, that, um, that Mary was coming back. And I, I would love, I would love, would have loved to have written specifically um, uh, about, that character, but also that character in relation to Sam, um, you know, because because Dean has memories of her where Sam doesn't, and and to to the sort of the tragedy of of her seeing what's become of her boys, the the, the pride of that, but also the the tragedy of it, but also you know for Sam to have, to have never had that person really, you know, like I think they're haunted by both of their parents, obviously, but that one, uh, but but Mary in particular, um, that's definitely a character I would have loved to written for. Um, there's a ton of characters that I just, it's less about stories and more about characters that I would love to, to write for, particularly in how they re relate to the boys, you know, um, you know, but, but that's a character that, that so quickly gets you to a good emotional story for the boys, 
you know, when you're pitching an episode, it doesn't matter how high concept it was or how, how, or in my case, sometimes weird it was, it was always, how does it relate to the boys and how does it relate to their, to their stories uh, and to their, to their arc for the season. And then hopefully if, if, if you really kind of hit all the buttons, what's their arc for the, for the, for the series. And it's no different if you're writing for, you know, uh, Cass or for, for, for Crowley uh, as well. Um, but that's one character in particular that like, that would have been a blast uh, to write for. And I, I would have loved to have written for uh, 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 Jody uh, more or Donna. Um, it's always fun to write for Bobby. Uh, Jim Beaver is one of those actors that, you know, he could read. I mean, people don't have phone books anymore, but if they did, um, he could read it and it would be really, really uh, exciting. He was the best actor to give exposition to because he was always able to make it sound like someone saying it for the first time and saying it in a way that was very conversational. So yeah, it's less about stories and more just about characters and dynamics and things to pursue. I mean, there there was an episode that, and I, I know that Lynn had asked, that was her softball question about uh, sort of a, a domestic day in the life of the boys. Um, I That was one definitely um, that, that, that was sort of got away from me. Um, so yeah, yeah. But by the way, um, no one ever said no to any of these. Um, it was always, I couldn't figure out the story. Uh, you know, the great thing about working on that show is, um, you know, typically I would say like, how about X? And they'd be like, okay, but what's the story? And I'd be like, shit, that's a good question. And I don't have an answer to it. Uh, and that happened many times. I, you know, I wanted to do, I think I called it the Tron episode. I just wanted to put the boys in a video game because I love the movie Tron. And everyone's like, well, that's cool. Like, that's a nice hook, but what's the point? What's the story? And I think it wasn't until Pac-Man Fever that we had a reason to tell, A, that story for all the characters, but in a way that kind of reflected on the, on the season. Definitely. Well, that's really cool that they're so open to ideas, though, and that they don't just say no to things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I ever got told, you know, uh, how dare, or, you know, don't do that. Some, so I'm, I'm now looking at the chat. Uh, the chat. Uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to keep up. Guys, I'm sorry. You guys are too fast, and you're way too smart, and I'm so old. Uh, I'm so, so old. <laughs> Um, but no, it was never, I, I don't, I don't recall anyways, uh, ever being told, absolutely not. You may not do that. How dare you? You're fired. It was always like, okay, but what's the story? Uh, and there were plenty of, of stories that eventually I sort of pushed through because I finally found one. Uh, I mean, the two examples I'm thinking of are like Pac-Man fever and, uh, and baby. Um, but I, 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 both times it was, it was always like, Hey, that's an interesting concept, but why do I care? Uh, and that's my job is to 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 uh, let people understand like here you, this is why you should care. So, so you were talking a lot about how you know sometimes you'd be like, oh, I have this idea, but mm -hmm. you know how does it fit into the story? Right. Um, a lot of people were also asking, you know, how do you deal with writer's block? Um, that's a great question. Um, I so this is I, I can only speak for myself. Uh, everyone's writing process is different, and everybody's writer's block is different. Um, I'm not a big believer in it. I'm usually a big believer that when I'm feeling quote unquote blocked, the story is telling me uh, you're doing something wrong. Something doesn't fit, and you're trying to force it. So it's it's almost like the story's way of asserting its own will on you and saying like maybe you need to take a time out, <laughs> go for a walk play some video games. Those are the things that I do to kind of get out of my headspace for a little bit um, and, and kind of rewind. Uh, the analogy that I've given is, is uh, I, I've uh, you know, dealt with anxiety in my life and, and I've had uh, my, my share of panic attacks. And nine times out of 10, usually that panic attack is, is it's scary and it's, it's sad and I, and I hate it, but it's also my body's way of sending me a message of like saying, hey, maybe it's time to take a time out. Like we need to talk about some stuff. And in some ways, I feel like writer's block is the same way. It's, it's, again, it's the story or your characters or your process telling you, like, hey, you're, you're putting a square peg in a round hole here, so let's take a break. And the, for me, because I, I like to look at writing as a job and I like to try to make it as structured as possible, because it's an impossible job. It's weird and it's lonely and it's horrible, but if you can bring some structure to it, it can be kind of fun. Uh, I like to work on a lot of different projects. So by way of example, like, you know, this morning I was working on a comic book script. And I got stuck, and I was like, "Shit, I don't know how to get out of this. I have no clue." So I, you know, closed my uh, 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 that window, and I opened up another one. And uh, there's a, a comic book pitch that I'm working on, and so I started working on that. And and that one was, you know, the was flowing very well, and I felt very good about it. And I felt like, okay, this is giving me some uh, some 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 answers. And then I went back to the other one. I was still stuck, 
Um, and so I went for a walk uh, and it's a thousand degrees in here uh, uh, in Los Angeles right now. It's, it's hotter than the sun, um, but like getting out of your head and the process of literally moving, um, you know, makes you use part of your brain that you're not thinking about, which is like, oh, I move one leg at a time, but you're not thinking about it. And so it frees up this space for me. Uh, and I, usually I will come back from a walk with a solution to one of the problems. It's not always the problem that I thought I was, uh, you know, fixing, but usually it's a solution. So, you know, if you're feeling blocked, it's usually your story or your process is telling you something's not working. And my advice would be to listen to it and either create a, a second space for you to really kind of play and just have fun or to find a way to play and have fun to get out of your head and then come back to the problem. Awesome. Well, that's good advice for any aspiring writers out there. Right, if so I can do it, you can do it. That's also my other advice. <laughs> <laughs> it's good advice. So with, you know, you talking about sort of how you write, like what is, what is the process for writing a comic? Is it, is it a lot different than writing a script for a TV show besides like the obvious format? Sure. Um, it is pretty different. Um, I think the, the similarities can be like, you know, on a, sh on a I was going to say show, on a comic like uh, Silk or um, uh, Doctor Strange and the Sorcerer Supreme, because it's ongoing, you're making some decisions in the same way that you would in an episodic uh, space. You have a lot less room to tell the story, particularly in modern comics where you're dealing with like, you know, 20 pages and, you know, five to six panels tops per page. Um, that's kind of where the overlap ends. Um, I think all writing comes from trying to figure out what your characters want and then doing the, this is the, this is the part that sucks, is making sure that they never get it. Uh, that's your job. Uh, uh, that's, that, that's, that's uh, you know, I always used to say, I love Sam and Dean, but my job is to be horrible to them. Um, and obviously you don't want to be horrible forever. You want to have moments of, of lightness. Otherwise it's just going to be uh, nihilistic or whatever. Um, but you know, with, with comics, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different process in so much as you're working with far fewer collaborators, but that's also, again, what I love about it. You know, I loved collaborating with the actors on Supernatural. I loved collaborating with the editors on Supernatural and our directors and the, and like I said, the, the incredible crew, um, you're dealing though with, you know, at any stage of the script uh, on the TV side, you know, there are, you know, there's a handful of writers, there's the studio and there's the network, then suddenly there's a director, and then suddenly, by the end of it, you know, you're collaborating with two to 300 people. It's an enormous undertaking. Um, so authorship on something like that is, is it, it's just a different process. Um, whereas with comics, you know, you're working with five or six people, and it's five or six people traditionally who are, are, who are really, like, driven because they love comics. They love it. It's such a, a unique art form, and it's and it's such a, in my opinion, um, beautiful art form. And so it, it's a different process. Um, I have to say, working on the most recent comic, uh, Doctor Strange, I've worked with this artist, uh, Javier Rodriguez. He's a really brilliant Spanish artist, and we have a, a, a really fun shorthand that now I, I try to do with every artist. Uh, where it's much more of a dance. It's much more of a collaboration. I'm less, you know, sort of panel one, panel two, panel three. Because you you can be very directorial if you want in a in a comic book script, um, but because Javier is so brilliant and talented, I, I want to get I want him to be you know as engaged as I am, and so you know now whether it's working with Javier or you know uh, Nate Stockman who's another really talented artist, it's it's a lot of fun to do that collaboration, and because it's a smaller group, it's a much more intimate experience, um, and it's 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 also great in like television that you're making this product. Um, that like you can hold in your hands, you know, that's what I loved about Supernatural every two, you know, uh, one to two months, I got to make a little movie um, with two of my, you know, uh, favorite actors and, uh, 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 and, and an amazing supporting cast of, of really, really, really talented people. The chance to get to do that is pretty, is pretty awesome. And, you know, like I just got a package from Marvel today. I, I did a, I pinch hit uh, 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 for, uh, one of the Star Wars comic books, Poe Dameron, uh, I wrote the annual that comes out next week. And, you know, to hold that comic in my hand and like, you know, see my name in the blue font, the blue Star Wars font was, was pretty great. Uh, but, you know, on that comic, I worked with, you know, five or six people, you know, total. So it's a, it's, it's a completely different experience. There's, there's different ways of, uh, or, or there are certain differences, 
but writing wise, you know, it, it's it's a different layout, it's a different format, and it's a, it's just a different dance. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I figured. So, I mean, with your you write comics and you've also written for Supernatural. Would you ever be interested in writing for one of the Marvel TV shows or movies? Yeah, sure. Yeah, if you can uh, let them uh, write me or let me or let me uh, get them to let me write. Uh, God, I'd write any of them. Um, I mean, if they could, if they end up making another Fantastic Four, that's my favorite. Um, not the movies, uh, the comics. Um, I, I don't think I'm the right person for it, but I'd love to see like you know a Black Widow movie or. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a, I'm a Marvel guy. I, I love Marvel and DC, but um, and I loved Wonder Woman. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I would, I, I'd love to. It would be fun. Definitely. I mean, I love the Netflix content that yeah. Marvel has been putting out. So it'd be cool, maybe to see you writing some of that as well. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? If I was lucky enough, I, I, I I'd love the opportunity. No. Really? So we've got a couple questions about um, Comic Cons. Some people asking if you're going to be at any upcoming Comic Cons. And then I was just wondering, what are your general feelings about Comic Cons? Like, do you go to them as a fan sometimes or just? Yeah, um, I don't have any specific plans. If anybody wants to invite me, they can invite me. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to Comic Con, but I'm just going for fun. I mean, I'll... I'll do a couple signings at the Marvel booth and uh, a couple panels. I'll do whatever they want. And I'm, I'm doing uh, another, uh, uh, a similar panel to a, 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 to the one I did at New York Comic Con last year. Um, but no, I, honestly, I like to go as a fan. Like, um, you know, at C2E2, the best part about it uh, for me was, um, it was such a great experience to meet, you know, so many uh, you know, different fans from all over the country. Cause you know, C2E2 or New York Comic Con, you know, you're dealing with, uh, you know, a different region than just being here. And I also went to Emerald City Comic Con, which is a great show. Um, but the, 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 my favorite part of the day uh, is sneaking in a little bit early because when you have an exhibitor badge, you get in an hour early. And I would just kind of run around and do all my shopping and, you know, buy my trade paperbacks. And I have an embarrassing amount of toys on the other side of the room. And I collect, uh, 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 they're over there, I'm staring at them because they're staring at me, uh, Galactus and Dr. Doom figures. So, no, I, I like going as a fan. I, I to me, um, uh, you know, whether or not I even buy anything, you know, uh, uh, retail therapy is fun. You know, there used to be, uh, when I was at USC, there used to be uh, a show at the, at the Shrine Auditorium and I would go every month. And even when I was broke, you know, I would just go and walk around and just look at old comics that I grew up reading. And I, for me, it's just kind of a way to kind of reconnect with what I love. You know, I, I think of myself as a fan first. Um, and, and, and that's where I'd like to stay. Awesome. Well, you just, you just mentioned Galactus and, I, I don't really know too much about that character or about either of these characters, but that's okay. Jules, Jules from the Supernatural Wiki asked me to ask you, who would win in a pancake eating contest, Galactus or the Thing? Um, my standard answer, because I get this one a lot, Jules, um, is the fans. I think all of us would win because we would get to see that that that. Uh, but obviously, it'd be Galactus. Come on, come on, Jules. You knew the answer to that question. I love that Jules hit me with the hard hitting. Uh, question. Uh, uh. <laughs> a lot of people asking about food. You know, I got yeah. one question. What's your favorite? What's your favorite food? What's my favorite food? Um, Verner's. Does this count as food? Verner's, uh, Michigan Pop. Verner's. No, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a nice Midwestern boy. I like Coney Island. So, you know, give me a Coney dog or something like that. All right. So. Let's My favorite see. color is green. I went to USC and University of Michigan. I'm trying to think of generic questions. You, know? you got asked all of those, actually. Oh, okay. good, good, good. Yes. So you're answering all of the right generic questions, apparently. We've got a lot of them. I'm just trying to scroll through. There's so many. All right. I think I wrote down, let's see. Um, what I ever, okay, that one we answered. Uh, what was the hardest episode to write for Supernatural? Is that? Probably yes. Not the hardest episode of the Cape. No one's asked me any Cape question. That's fine. We'll do another hour on that one. Um, uh, the hardest episode to write was every single one, um, and I, I would I would reach a point where so my process was once the story was broken, I write what I call and uh, it's someone else's expression. I'm just I'm just stealing it, but I, I write what I call the vomit draft, which is I just kind of puke it out, and it's usually you know 20 pages too long, and it's it's got you know horrible dialogue and. And then I just kind of chip away at it and kind of shape it. And 
I think for the last three years, like every single episode, I would say at one point to my wife, and she's a writer too, I'd be like, ah, this one's really hard. I think I screwed this one up and this one doesn't work. And she would she would say without, without like every single time she would be like, you know, you said that about the last one, right? So I either got worse as I went or, or uh, I, 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 um, I uh, was just taking it uh, uh, really seriously. But you know, to answer the question, one of the hardest ones was the first one. Um, not because, um, it was a tough episode. I mean, it was a tough episode in some regards, but it was my first episode on the show, and I had never been staffed on a show where I didn't really know anybody. I didn't either have a friend on the show or someone didn't help me get the job. Like, this was my first, like, I was kind of a stranger in a strange land, and um, I was really nervous about it, um, you know, but I got a lot of really great help and great notes from, um, you know, from Adam Glass and and uh, and from Sarah, and, and actually David Reed as well, who uh, used to be our scripty on the show. They really kind of helped me make sure I was, you know, on the right path. And, you know, I can point to moments uh, in that episode where it's like, oh, yeah, like Bob kind of got me right back on the path for that scene. You know, it is a surreal thing when you're getting a note about writing a scene with Bobby Singer from Bob Singer. Um, that was a weird experience, um, but it was a good note. So it ended up being very helpful. So, yeah, that they were all very, very challenging in their own ways. But that first one was definitely like, it was it, like once I got past that one, I started to feel like, okay, you know, I remember pitching that episode and I said, nobody puts baby in a corner. And uh, Sarah uh, smiled and she said, you know, you just wrote your first line of Supernatural. And that, that just put me at ease that I had at least, uh, at least in the pitch process had figured something out. So, yeah. That's so cool. So, I mean, you know, you said that all the all of the episodes were really hard to write. Did you feel a lot of pressure being tasked to write the 200th episode? Because that was such a monumental thing. Yeah, I mean, it was terrifying. Um, and I still don't, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll probably have anxiety about that forever. You know, it, it was a very, you know, I had a different expectation, I think, coming into the season because, you know, when you come into the season, you know, you're not necessarily sure what's going to happen. And, and the bosses usually kind of figure out what they want to do, particularly in the first half of the season. And um, when they said that they wanted to do something kind of different with the 200th episode and that it would be not necessarily like outside of continuity, but it would be a little bit more standalone. -y, I, I, I didn't know that that was the direction we were going to go. And then when I, you know, when they told me specifically that they wanted to do a musical uh, in a high school, um, you know, again, my first reaction was like, that's crazy. That's, that has such a high threshold for failure. Uh, I, I want to fail on that. I want to die on that hill. Um, uh, cause it was just too tempting. Um, and I think the only thing I really sort of adjusted from the original idea is that I wanted it to be at an all girls school. Um, there had been a previous episode that, that depicted a supernatural convention, uh, that did not look like the supernatural conventions that I've uh, crashed. And so uh, I really wanted to, uh, I thought that would be kind of a fun little, you know, reversal on that. But no, it was, it was, it was definitely daunting. Uh, believe me, when, when people found out what uh, it was about and uh, that there was a musical element, um, I definitely got some um, sternly worded uh, yeah, t uh, tweets um, about it. Um, but, you know, when it aired, it was a really special episode to watch. Like, I would try to watch... Um, you know, uh, at my office uh, for the East Coast uh, airing of an episode. And it was one of those times where, you know, Twitter had a tough time keeping up. Um, I think that one, like I knew with that one, like once Rob showed up at the end, like Twitter was basically like, I'm out, I'm done. There's too many, like you can check this tomorrow. Uh, and the only other time it was like that was uh, when Richard showed up uh, in an episode. We were actually sitting uh, in my office and we were like, you know, tweeting and, and watching people react to it. And we were just like, wait for it, wait for it. And then when he showed up, I just knew because like my, you know, my Firefox was like, nope, we're done. We're, there's no more tweeting for the, for the next hour. You can come back in a couple of days. Um, that was, that was really fun. That was really special. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, I figured you must have gotten uh, some people on Twitter being a little bit skeptical of the whole musical element because while I personally wasn't in the fandom at the time the show was coming out, I, you know, once upon a time recently did a musical episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of people, including myself, were very skeptical of that. So right. it, it's, I think it's something with, with a show that's not normally a, a musical, it, it's something that a lot of people are really skeptical about. But I think yeah. you've handled it really well. Well, you know, again, I, you know, I, I share, you know, if, if the episode worked, it's because, you know, uh, you know, again, Jeremy and Bob came in with, with the idea, but also, 
you know, a guy who I think just doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Uh, he's a quiet guy. He's a nice, uh, humble kid from Michigan. Um, but it's Phil, Shigri Phil Sigrisha, who's a director who I, I, I was fortunate enough to collaborate on a bunch of episodes with. And, and Phil went all in on that episode. He understood, you know, the magnitude of it in terms of it being the 200th, but he also understood the scale of it um, in terms of actually putting a musical up on its feet. Like he and, and Nicole, uh, one of the editors, like went to an actual high school production of I think Beauty and the Beast, um, which is which is pretty awesome. Um, you know, we we got to record the songs. I'm a, uh, a member of the musical union now. Uh, so, uh, which is, which is hilarious. Um, you know, you can, you can download that stuff on iTunes. It's pretty, it's pretty special, but Phil in particular, I think really, uh, you know, understood what we were trying to do in a way that he understood how, what a challenge it was to make it actually work visually and to make sure the story worked. And there's a lot of little moments in there that are, are just, just vintage Phil and, and getting great performances from the guys and, and, and the crew, you know. I, I, my only regret is that, you know, not all of the cast was in it, but, you know, our hope was that, you know, by putting them in the show within the show, uh, that they would be there in spirit. Well, it ended up being really great. It's definitely one of my favorite episodes. So. Well, thank you. It was fun to write. Definitely fun to write. Not, I, 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 and people ask me, that's another question I, I saw, which was the most fun to write. Um, and that's a tough one too. Um, the most fun though was probably baby. Um, that uh, it was an episode I tried to get through a couple different times, but at that point I had I had done a bunch of episodes, and this isn't a criticism of the show, but you know the show is um, predominantly a procedural show, and it's a network show, so there's a lot of rules that have to there's a lot of rigidity to the structure, and I kept noticing that like my, my favorite scenes to write were the scenes with uh, the boys in the car, because the story literally had to slow down. Um, because they're they're sitting in a car, you know, like they can't be punching or kicking or whatever. And one of the reasons we do those kind of scenes, uh, and it became like a, a staple of the show, is it's very easy to produce. You know, that car is on a stage uh, that's all fake background, and it's just the guy sitting there. And like all you need is those two guys and you know some cameras, and it's magic. You know, and I just kept noticing that those are the most fun to write. And in the, again, in the first episode I wrote, there was a scene where uh, the, the all out of love scene where they're uh, singing some air, where uh, Dean sings some air supply. And that was uh, something I pitched early on and, and actually got cut the day of because um, we were worried that we didn't have enough you know, money to produce the episode. But our director like kind of snuck it in and they shot it anyways. And I remember seeing that in the dailies and it ended up being like one of my favorite moments. And it's it's because the story is finally kind of allowed to kind of slow down and let characters talk about human emotions. Um, and so that was one of the, my, the reasons why I really wanted to write it was because I wanted to kind of sort of show the show from a different perspective, but also like let the guys just kind of talk and, and not air things out because, you know, you don't want to air it all out, but um, just to let it breathe a little bit. And that scene, uh, I think I, I, we kind of internally referred to it as the, the, the sleepover scene where they, they sleep in the car that was the first thing I sort of pitched. And I was like, if we don't have that top down shot, like, I don't want to do this episode. Like we have to have that visual, but there's a, there are dailies of that where it's the guys and it's like a six minute scene. It's, it's up until don't call me Shirley, which has a much longer scene. It was the longest scene I ever wrote for the show. And every single take, it didn't matter if you were on, you know, on Jared over Jensen's shoulder or the other way around, or if it was the two of them, every single take, they nailed it. Like, and that's not easy stuff to do. And it, it didn't matter if it was even on the close-ups. Uh, there's one take where I think at one point, one of them says the other one's lines and then the other one started saying the other lines and like suddenly Sam was Dean and Dean was Sam. And like, cause again, that's how prepared they are. That's how professional they are. And that's how, that's how great they are. And so like that one was pure joy to write because I knew I could literally just sit with a scene and kind of unpack some stuff. And I didn't have to worry about the, the story. like. The actual story of that episode is pretty thin. It's probably one of the thinnest cases they've ever had. It's like, I think there's a thing, probably. And then at the end, they're like, maybe it's tied. Not really. You know, it's it's very it's very much just more about these moments between moments that we don't get to see. So that one, I mean, I would, I, I you know, I, I said it in an interview before, like, I would have written like 30 of those episodes. It was just pure, pure joy to, to know that I was getting to unleash those actors, you know, and, and to let them do their thing, you know. Um, and I, I think I'm, I think I said to, to, to Misha, he would really enjoy that episode because he could literally get to phone it in. He literally got to like, you know, just 
just uh, just uh, do it on the day in a studio. So um, no, that one was uh, the most fun to write, definitely. Well, that one was really cool because I mean, like you said, it's, it's something that you don't really get to see too too much of them. Yeah. It, it was very like laid back and it was really cool to see. The yeah, the, the, we, we, we had a lot of fun just trying to kind of build out, um, you know, some of those moments. And, you know, one moment in particular, there was a fight scene in the car. And I think in my sort of, we, we brought Tom, uh, Tom Wright, uh, he's the reason that, mo that that episode happened, because it kind of fell right in the batting order. And also, he was the right director for it. And he's a phenomenally talented director. He was like, a storyboard artist for Alfred Hitchcock. He did the paintings in Night Gallery. I mean, this guy's a legend. And uh, one of my most prized possessions from the show, uh, apart from a prop that I stole, um, is uh, I have his copy of the script for Baby, and it's all annotated with his drawings and everything like that, which is super cool. But you know, we pitched him the fight scene, and we were a little bit timid because we were like, "Well, shit, how do you do a fight scene in a car?" And he was like, "No, no, no, don't, don't worry about it. Give me a little bit more room to play." And we did, and and you know, they shot most of that stuff on the day. Uh, Jensen learned how to do that reverse J turn. I put that in the script for like, I was like, does the reverse, and I was like, that, this will never happen. He learned how to do it on the day and totally nailed it. Um, that's not an easy stunt to do. Um, it's, it's a, I think they did it three times and, and he hit it, I think he hit it uh, all three times. So, but again, that's another example of like the, the collaboration of like, we had this idea for wouldn't it be cool to see a fight scene in the car, but it was kind of small. And then uh, because Tom is so brilliant, like he was able to kind of expand it out and, and really tell a story within that scene. It was brilliantly shot, the whole episode. Yeah. I, like, I like the part where the windshield wipers wipe the... <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Off the car. That, was, um, that was one of the first scenes that I pitched actually as sort of um, like a proof of concept of, of what the tone of the episode would be, that like it would be both, you know, uh, uh, serious and silly, which I think um, is something that uh, Supernatural does really, really well. Um, uh, but it was really fun to kind of build that scene out. And uh, and uh, that stuff was scripted, but there's little moments within it. Like there's a moment where uh, Dean reaches down to pick up the head to put it in the cooler. And Jensen just on the day added this moment of like reacting as if it tried to bite him, which again, is just a great a great actor in the scene, you know, playing the reality of the moment. There's another moment later on when when Matt and 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 Jared are playing th that scene and and they they found a real like truth to it that was not on the page like they played it they played it extremely real um, and that was really cool to see that in the dailies. Definitely. All right, so we've got time for about I guess we have two more questions that I really wanted to get to if you're okay with that. Yeah, yeah, bring it on. Let's do it. All right, so I really want to know the answer to Lynn's last question. Sure. Um, so she asked, one of the highlights of the last few seasons for her was the return of the Samulet. The which, Samulet. Yeah, she said it healed a palpable rift in canon. Wow. So can can you talk about That's your own? Yeah, I know. Big words. <laughs> I'm gonna look that one up later. So she said, can you talk about your own headcanon about where it was all this time and the decision about what to include in the actual dialogue to make that answer more or less explicit? Um, so a couple things to unpack there. Uh, I did not know what headcanon was until about a year or two ago. Uh, I can't remember who explained it to me, but they very patiently explained that to, uh, to me. Um, <clears throat> so I, as I said earlier, I, I became a fan of the show before I, I, I got the job. and. I remember when the uh, so-called Samulet uh, got thrown away. As a as a fan, I watched that and I was like, "Oh well," but of course, Sam grabbed it, and then we'll see it like at, at a critical moment later on. And I kept waiting for it to, to show up, <laughs> and it just never did. And um, I think I first started pitching bringing it back probably at the end of season seven even though there was no reason uh, plot mechanics wise. And I was never again told no. It was always like, well, why? It's been a long time. What's the story? What's the story? But I do admit, um, I did sort of foam the runway a little bit. Um, I wrote another episode uh, in season 11 uh, called Into the Mystic. And at the very end of that episode, I um, there's a bit where Sam goes back to his room and he puts um, the literature from the retirement community into his little like box of mementos. And 
I put in the script, um, I, I can't remember exactly how I phrased it. Um, well, here, I'll, I'll look it up, hold on. Um, yeah, I, 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 hold on, let me, oh, is that the right? Yeah, that's the right. Uh, so I, I put it in there, basically said, you know, it's a bunch of keepsakes, it's pictures of mom and dad, et cetera. And I said, and is that the Samulet we see tucked in there, question mark? And then I think I wrote like something like, I don't know, man, you tell me. Um, and when I got notes, because this is the writer's draft I'm looking at, um, which is much longer than the episode ended up being. Uh, when I got notes on it, they were like, hey, like, that's cool, but let's let's make it the, um, I think we decided to make it the the, the amulet from the, the 200th episode, which I think you can kind of see yes. like a hint at. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know I was going to be writing uh, the last episode, uh, or the, 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 the last episode for me that year uh, was going to be episode 20. I actually thought it was going to be um, Safe House, but I ended up writing one more, which, which ended up being uh, a real treat for me. Um, and when we started to kind of unpack what that episode was, like, again, it's kind of like the 200th episode. Like, you know, it was one thing to have a fan theory be like, oh, Chuck is God, question mark. Um, but to actually say it, underline it, bold it, italicize it, highlight it, um, project it in 3D, whatever's left, um, was a very scary proposition. Um, and I knew that it would be kind of um, uh, pushing some boundaries in terms of what is logically canon or not. Um, but more importantly than that, I really wanted to make sure that the episode really tied back directly to the boys in a personal way. And that the appearance of this character was not just like, oh, hey, it's Chuck, you know, that dude, you know, I wanted it to tie back directly to something that was very personal to them. And, you know, for me, it was that, that, that necklace, you know, um, I, I, I had referenced it once before in the 200th episode with the, you know, the sort of the faux Samulet, um, uh, which was my commentary on like the, 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 some of the merchandising I've seen for it, it doesn't quite look right. Yeah. Um, um, which has always bothered me, but, um, but it was really important to me, uh, that, that episode, because so much of that episode is kind of like a one act play between two really phenomenal actors, uh, Rob and, and Curtis, who went above and beyond, uh, performance wise. But then it sort of pivots in the middle and it becomes, you know, Sam and Dean's story. And it had, it, it, it felt like it had to be something really personal and something emotional. And when we were talking about the episode, I, I, I referenced the movie Amadeus a lot because it's about, you know, sort of this conversation about God, but this is a conversation um, with God. And um, I really wanted to find a way to, to, to work music into the episode because, you know, a lot of people talk about music as the language of God and so on and so forth. And, and I think one of the first things I pitched for it was I went to, and I went to Bob because um, Bob is a very uh, talented musician. And, and um, he also knew that Rob is a very talented musician. And I, I had this idea. I was like, hey, like, I think the ending of this episode is God singing. And I think very specifically it's this song, but maybe not this song, which it ended up being that song. Um, and, and Bob, to his credit, he was like, okay, well, what's the story? And fortunately, by that point, I'd kind of worked it out, but I, I didn't want to pitch it unless I knew I could kind of land in that space because I wanted that last act to be uh, no dialogue any, except for uh, Chuck's last line at the end. And I just wanted it to be about the boys reacting to this, to this amulet. Um, I did not think it would be... Uh, uh, something that people would debate about uh, whether or not it, where the Samulet sort of came from, but I was sort of tickled by it. Um, but then I think the the script has since found its way on the internet as these things do. Um, my sort of head canon for it or the way that I justified it when I pitched it, and again, this is not canon, this is head canon, right, was to me Sam took it out of the trash and I don't think he had it on his person the whole time. Um, that that wouldn't make a lot of logical sense and also wouldn't make some there would be some continuity things But I always th thought that they either had some duffel bag or some bag that they kind of put like their most You know personal private shit in and that that's where it was and then once they got into the bunker He kind of put it into that box. We just sort of don't see it in that episode But when he starts to think in that season uh, that maybe he's talking to God to me like that's when he grabbed it and started kind of carrying around in his pocket uh, That was my justification for it uh, I know it does not uh, satisfy, um, it does not dot all the I's or cross all the T's, but uh, that was sort of my, uh, my way into it. But it was, it was, I knew that going into it, there was going to be some uh, canonical conundrums. Is that an expression? 
Um, but I, I, my, my gut was that if, if we felt it was true, if we felt that this moment was, was authentic between the boys, uh, hopefully some of the other stuff that maybe isn't like, you know, totally nailed down, uh, um, would be forgiven. Um, that was my hope. That was, that was certainly my hope, but I guess, I guess, yes, that's, that's my, my headcanon for it. Definitely a good one. I always thought it, I thought it was Sam too. I thought he picked it up as well. So yeah. that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, and then you said about Rob singing. Yeah. That was a very, very cool moment in, in the episode. I don't know, like if you, if you knew this, but, um, I think he does. He sings the song at supernatural conventions now, yeah. but at, yeah. I went to the Pittsburgh one, the first one, and it was very soon after that episode aired. And I think mm. it was like one of the first times he, he sang the song at a convention yeah. and everyone asked him to do it. So he was like, okay. And so he came out on stage and the microphone broke. So right. he couldn't use the microphone and it, none of it was working. So he told all of us to be very, very quiet. <laughs> and he he sang it without a microphone. That's awesome. Completely acoustic That's on awesome. the guitar. And it was so silent in that room besides him. And it was a huge room. It was literally yeah. like the size of an airplane hangar. Completely th- silent except for him. And it was so cool. That's, you know, when... When when Bob uh, Singer signed off on it, because you know I knew he was directing the episode, and I also, like I said, I knew he's a musical or a music fan, and he's a musician, and a very talented one. Um, um, I, I I reached out to Bob or to 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 Rob Benedict, and I was like, hey, I'm thinking about this thing. Would you be comfortable? Do you think this this works for your character? And do you think this works? I was like, I don't have the whole episode yet, but this is kind of what I'm thinking. And and Rob is such a gamer and 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 such a talented guy, and he was like, yeah. He said, like, well, what are you thinking about for the song? And I, I, w- I have sometimes done this to success and sometimes not so much. Uh, you know, your first draft theater is sometimes, but like the song that popped in my head was Fairly Well. And I was like, or some such. And I think Bob and I both suggested a couple other songs. And I think Rob did too, but we, we all just kind of kept coming back to that, to that song. Um, I don't know why, it just felt like the right song. Um, and... Uh, he started kind of working on his own version of it. And um, I don't know if it's ever been released. I don't think it's on the DVD, but hopefully someday they released it. They shot that um, a couple of takes and it's an amazing, someone shot a behind the scenes video of, of Rob singing. And then you kind of pan over and you can, you can kind of like the story you're sharing, like, but it was on the day on the set, like everyone's just watching him and like chin hands and like, and, you know, like, it was an amazing thing to view the dailies, but then to see that sort of behind the scenes where everyone kind of stopped working and, you know, you know, or people who weren't working kind of came to set and, and watched him perform this thing. Uh, and, and the video is, I think it's of the whole song. So hopefully that someday uh, sees the light of day because it was a really, it was a really special moment. And again, it's, it's all a testament to, to Rob. Like Rob such a, is such a, a giving actor and such a talented actor. And he's so understood uh, inherently, uh, the character, uh, uh, certainly better than I did. And, you know, he and Curtis and I had a lot of conversations, you know, leading up to it. Cause I just, I reached out to both of them, like Curtis, the same thing. Like I needed, I, I had an idea for that scene about, um, you know, the, uh, autobiographies and stuff like that. And I was like, but I know he's a huge musician, uh, a huge music fan as well. And I was like, I need a book that says this and that. And then he recommended the two books that were in there and had reached out to some friends as well. So it was, it's a real, it's the, the success of that episode is really just, it's all about Rob and, and, and Curtis and, uh, and, and Bob, who, who really did a phenomenal job directing the episode. Everyone did a wonderful job with that. That was definitely a highlight of the season. It was a fun one to write. That was, I, I was, like I said, I wasn't expecting to write it. So it was kind of like a, like an added treat, you know? Mm-hmm. All right. So we've gone a little oh, over goodness. what I'm looking we thought at these, we were. These questions. Shin's handsing headcanon accepted. Uh, oh my goodness! Besides telekinesis, which power would I like to see on SPN? Flight. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> someone just wrote sad. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> are you reading the same ones I'm reading? I'm trying to see. Yeah. Someone. Uh, people keep calling you dad. Oh, that's. That's awesome, I guess. <laughs> I'm not uh, a dad, but sure, why not? I'll take it. Um, 
I'm looking also online and uh, did I answer what my favorite color was? It's green. Yes. Uh, are there any other speed round questions you have for me? Oh, I do not know. Well, we've answered quite a few of the ones that I had from Twitter. And I never answered Lynn soft Lynn softball questions was I, I wanted to do an episode about uh, like a mundane day in the life with Sam and Dean folding laundry. Um, uh, I, I would love to see them go grocery shopping. Uh, I hate grocery shopping with a passion. Um, and I would love to see them like at a Trader Joe's uh, arguing about kale uh, or, you know, quinoa or something like that. Uh, that would be a good 40 minutes. I would watch that. <laughs> Um, uh, let's see if there's any other ones. Uh, oh, my best friend, one of my best friends, Lauren, she just asked if you like whales. Sure. I mean, yeah, why not? Who doesn't love whales? I'm terrified of, of them, but, um, yes, whales are good. Shamu, but free Shamu, right? Yeah, sure. I like whales. Why not? <laughs> you heard she it like here first. I hate pineapple on pizza and I, and I, and I, and I love whales. But you like pineapple off of pizza, right? Oh yeah, pineapple is fantastic. Let's let don't get it twisted here. Like let's not start a controversy. But just doesn't belong on pizza, not not even a little bit. Not even a little. Do you like pineapple on pizza? It's no, okay. I don't. You don't? Or you do? I don't. Okay. See, there you go. See, this is why this is why this is working. Yes, I, I do not enjoy pineapple on pizza. Now someone wants to know if I like whales on pizza. No, how dare you? That's creepy. Oh, someone asked me what my favorite episodes of the show were that I didn't write. Did, did, did we answer that one or no? No, you did not. Um, I, um, I had go-to ones. Um, and these are just my opinion. I don't know if they're the best ones. But when I was looking for inspiration or just for like the voice of the show, I would very often watch Mystery Spot. That's one of my all-time favorites. Um, I think it does the sweet and the sour that Supernatural does so well. Um, and I honestly would go back and watch the pilot a lot. Um, and, um, and swan song, probably in that order. Those are my, those are my top, those are my top 10, just three. <laughs> There's too many others to pick, but I, I did, I did very often go back and look at those, um, partic particularly the pilot as the, sh as, as my time went on was, I was just so impressed that, that Kripke really knew the show very early on and, and had such a strong voice, uh, for those characters and that the actors knew the show from very early on. That's, that's not an easy thing to accomplish. Um, it's, I think it's one of the, one of the best pilots. Definitely. Like I, um, I made a list of my top 10 favorites and I had to put the pilot in there because I mean, yeah. with every show, like you can't say the same thing for every show. You can't say that every show has had a really great pilot, but supernatural is just one of those shows that had an amazing pilot. Yeah, you know, sometimes you watch a show, and especially like a network show, you go back and you watch that first one, you're like, oh, this was kind of shit, wasn't it? But that one, like, I really feel like they they captured, um, they did one of the things that most shows don't do in that, which is that they uh, they captured uh, a sense of what the show's ongoing mythology would be, but also delivered an episode of the week, um, you know, and, you know, the, the, the two fridged characters aside, uh, I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty damn good episode. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. I think, I'm trying to see if there's any other other little ones. Uh, someone I, 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 asked if you slept with your socks on or off. Uh, it depends on the day. Um, it really depends on the day. Probably off. That's a very hard hitting question. I know. They said that someone asked Misha that on Tumblr the other day. So. I know. Well, you know what? I'm not answering that. I, I take that answer back because Misha has failed to answer any of my uh, sternly. Uh, worded questions. I'm going to continue asking him questions until he finally answers. Oh yes, I've so, seen. He he has not answered any of your. <laughs> someday, if he thinks I'm giving up, um, uh, <laughs> I can't believe. Oh, I I I I'm not denouncing my internet children. I, I just the, the the whole dad thing is a little uh, is a little hilarious to me. Uh, but sure, I'll I'll be uh, dad prime. Okay, why not? Sure. I don't know what that means. It's fine. Um, you have a bunch of different Twitter handles to choose from now. I know. It's Dad Prime Hates uh, Pineapples is, is my new Twitter handle. Um, pineapples on pizza. Pineapples on pizza. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did I answer all of your questions? How did I get started writing as a writer for the show? How often did I visit? Uh, you asked me about Aileen, 200th episode. We had talked about Wayward Daughters. Um, would oh, I, I ever... Sorry, I didn't ask you how you got started writing for Marvel. 
Oh, um, Supernatural, strangely enough. Um, Ellie Pyle, who is a really terrific editor, uh, who used to be an editor at, at Marvel. I've been wanting to get into comics forever, and um, um, Ellie is a fan of Supernatural, uh, and so she's awesome. Uh, and we had a mutual friend, and we just kind of became uh, email pen pals. And uh, at one point during the Spider-Verse event, she was like, hey, do you want to pitch a story? And I was like, well, great. Do I pay now or do I pay after? Like, how does it? And she's like, no, no, we'll pay you. Like, you just got to pitch an idea. And really what she was doing was auditioning me to, to write Silk. So I, I, I owe my, 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 my time at Marvel to, to Supernatural. A lot of great things in my life I owe to Supernatural. That's so cool. How one thing just kind of led to another. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like, you know, 16 years of trying to get into comics and failing. And then uh, Supernatural was my, uh, I was on a panel about like, how did you break into comics? And I was like, uh, my advice is get a job on Supernatural. So do that. And then the other one will follow eventually, I guess. The Supernatural family really is great. Very supportive. They are the best. They are the best. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, Adam used to say it all the time, like, don't ever, you know, forget that this is a once in a lifetime experience to work on a show like this. To, to get to um, interact with people like this, to, to, to be able to have the, uh, you know, people that are this smart, this passionate, this creative, this funny. Um, it, it's, a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And, and uh, uh, you, gotta, you, gotta, you, you gotta really embrace it. Definitely. So I embrace yeah. all of my internet children according to whatever I was yelled at about here. Yes. I'm so confused. I'm so confused. It's fine. <laughs> It's the internet. It's going to be confusing. <laughs> I'm so old. Like you'll, you can translate this for me. You can email me after, and and you can tell me what problematic uh, uh, things I said. I'm sure you were fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we we really are running really long on this. So I apologize, but no, it's all good. This was fun. Um, I really appreciate you having me. Oh, definitely, and thank you so much for being here. I Anytime. am so happy to have you on the channel. Um, but I I figured a really good way to and the live stream was with like the most asked question that so many people asked. And it's what advice do you have for people who want to become a writer for a TV show or a comic series? Um, boy, that's a, do you have another hour? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, a couple different things. Um, you know, make sure you have no other demonstrable skills. Uh, I, I am utterly unemployable. Uh, I'm incredibly stupid uh, with math. Like, there's nothing else I can do. But, you know, I firmly believe, and, and this isn't me just, you know, uh, you know, bullshitting. Like, I think everybody has a story to tell. And I think if you, if you sit down and do the work and create a structure for yourself, um, you're going you're gonna to tell the story that you want to tell, whether it's a TV script or a comic book or a movie or a novel. Um, you know, or, um, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, if you're already writing, you know, uh, I've met a lot of, uh, people at conventions that'll say like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just writing fan fiction. And it's like, that's bullshit. You're writing, you're writing, you're writing fiction, you're writing. There's no qualifier, you know, um, and it's all great experience. Um, um, I think, you know, the more you can treat it like a job and the more you can give yourself structure, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, I, when I was first starting out, I had a couple of jobs and I would write at night, even when I got my first staff job and it was a very tough show and we were working late into the night, I'd get home at one or two in the morning and then I would write from two to five of my own stuff. Uh, you got to carve it out and, and make it as much as a routine as possible. And, and don't be so hard on yourself. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's tough. But if you sit down and you can create a structure for yourself, the only part you can really learn is the structure, right? of how to do it, like I'm gonna write from hour X to hour you know, Z, and then learning the structure of your craft, whether it's you know, comic books or, or movies or TV. You know, if you wanna get into TV, you're gonna to have to read a lot of scripts. You're also probably gonna to have to move to Los Angeles. Um, if you wanna get into comic books and you're, and you're not an artist, uh, you need to meet some artists and, and pay them for their work um, so that you're collaborating together and creating something together. Um, it's possible to do it though. I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to bullshit like, but the more you can create structure for yourself in terms of how you're treating it as a job, because it's a job. I think a lot of people think like, oh, you just sit down and you're right. Well, yeah, some days you do, but what are the days when you don't want to do it? What are the day? Like, it's like any other job, you know, I've worked construction, I've waited tables. Um, you know, I've had, I, I was a driver, you know, and there were days when I didn't want to do those jobs, but I, I needed them as a, as a means to an end. 
And it's the same thing with writing. You know, like there are days when I sit down, I'm like, oh, I don't think I have it today, but I'll try something else. I'll write something else. Like I said before, I'll try to get myself into that mode because it's a job. Um, if you wait for inspiration, it's not going to come. Um, having said that, like there are times when you're going to be excited, keep a notebook with you, write stuff down. Um, you know, I eavesdrop a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of lines uh, that I just overheard and put into, into stuff. Um, you know, uh, and if you can, if you have the time, read as much as you can, read as much as you can about, um, uh, and not just about your craft. Like, you know, I always recommend books like The Art of Dramatic Writing by Lejos Egri. Uh, I like Bogler's uh, study on, um, on mythical storytelling. It's kind of bullshit, but it's also, it works. Uh, Save the Cat is another book that people will read and maybe think it's silly, but it's a very compelling argument to how to, how to simply tell a story. Learn the structure first and then tear it down and make it your own. Your biggest strength and attribute is going to be knowing how to, how to break and tell a story, uh, particularly on the TV side, which is a much more social business than like working in, in, in necessarily like features or comics where you can kind of work on your own. You're going to be working and collaborating with others. So the more you can, you can kind of put that into your you know, sort of repertoire, the, the better off you're going to be. But just write every day and read every day. It, it, it's not impossible. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, extremely fortunate to get to do what I do. Um, but I'm also just a kid from, you know, from the suburbs of Detroit, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And I, I genuinely mean that. And I also, if you're listening to this, I want you to do it because I love stories and I want to hear your story. So just sit down and do the work. Um, you know, it's a job, but it's also when it's clicking and, you know, that song's been on repeat for 10 hours and you have no idea what time it is or what day it is. Uh, it's, it's some of the, it's some of the best uh, work you can do. Uh, um, so yeah, please, please tell your stories, but, but uh, uh, just treat it like a job. Excellent advice as always. So you did a great job <laughs> with this whole thing. Thank you so much again for- Well, thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, if I didn't get to your question, I apologize. I'll try to do, maybe not tonight, but another night I'll, I'll try to, I'll, I'll, and I'll tag you in them as well, or if you see ones that we forgot, just send them my way, and I'll, I'll try to use the internets. This is how I type, by the way. Um, but uh, if I didn't get to your questions, I apologize. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to do so, or, or we can do this again sometime. Definitely, yeah. I would love to have you back whenever you want to come on. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Tell your dad I said hello. I will. All right. Um, so thank you again so much for being here. Thank you guys thank you. for tuning in. Thanks, gang. And Yay. Okay. Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.